Well, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 415th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC this evening for a conversation between David Sally and Jason Rosenfeld. We are thrilled to have the poet Carlos Egaña here, who will read to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. Uh, we'd like to start by thanking the Dermot Company for supporting this month of the New Social Environment. Uh, here at the Rail, we are celebrating our 21st anniversary this October. Uh, you can learn more about the Dermot Company and the Rail's curatorial projects at 66 Rockwell through the links that I will post in the chat in just a moment. Here at the Rail, we open all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on the Nabe Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom and recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation, as said by the great Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we will be posting in just a moment. Uh, and now to introduce today's guest and host, Artist David Sally's paintings have been shown in museums, galleries, and major international expositions worldwide for over 35 years. Sally is a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. A collection of his essays, How to See, was published in 2016 by W.W. Norton, and his current exhibition, Tree of Life, is on view at Scarstead Gallery, New York, through October 30th. Our host today is Distinguished Chair and Professor of Art History at Marymount Manhattan College, Jason Rosenfeld, PhD, who has curated exhibitions, the exhibitions, John Everett Millay at the Tate Britain, uh, the Pre-Raphaelites, Victorian Avant-Garde at the Tate Britain and National Gallery of Art in DC, and River Crossings at Olana and Cedar Grove, Hudson and Catskill, New York. He's a senior writer and editor-at-large here for the Brooklyn Rail and NSC veteran Without further ado, Jason, over to you. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you, David, for joining us tonight. It's a great pleasure having you at this curious hour of 6 o'clock PM, the cocktail hour. So I encourage everyone to settle in with your gin and tonic or, or uh, old fashioned or cherry lime Ricky, whatever is your poison. Um, and we're going to have a really interesting show tonight. Um, David, welcome. And I wanted to thank a few people myself before we get going. Thank you to Anna Maria and Callie and Rose at Scarstead Gallery for very helpful. Um, Mary Schwab in David's studio, um, Nick and Malvika and Anya, of course, at the rail. Um, and we welcome Carlos Saganya. Look forward to hearing his poetry later. So good stuff to talk about um, tonight. Uh, David, welcome. Why don't you just say a few words, if you like, and I'll start the presentation. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for the invitation to join this evening. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what you have to say about <laughs> work or whatever. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I'm all ears, if they say. Great. Great. Well, here's the opening slide. You can see the Instagram addresses. I I encourage you to follow David. He was out and about, right, in the galleries the other day and posting things that he was seeing with no no text, just the images, which I thought was cool, was good. Um, just stuff to see. I love the way the artists use Instagram. Everyone does it a little bit differently, but it's always wonderful to see what artists are looking at and also what they're what they're up to. So I encourage everyone to go to Scarstead Gallery, um, 79th Street East, 79th Street, just off of. Lexington, right next to the late lamented Nectar coffee shop, which closed a victim of COVID. Um, there's another Nectar in 82nd and Madison, but it's not quite the same. Scarstead Gallery, uh, totally recently refurbished, and David's works fill three floors of the gallery. You see the building there on the right. It's the former Chester Dale mansion. Chester Dale, who was a great patron of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You can see his old collection there. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful building. The works are up through October 30th, which is of course Saturday. And uh, then the cause will move into there. So um, you know, Scarsett has a great slate of artists, but I encourage you to go see this show because it is 
knockout. Um, here is what you see when you first come in. Um, it's called Tree of Life. Uh, I, every work in the show is titled Tree of Life with a number. Um, the numbers are not sequential though, are they, David? Because I know some like higher numbers are from 2020 and some lower numbers from 2021. I can't um, explain it. They just seem all out of whack, but they're, yeah. I, I, it's the first time I've resorted to numbers. I, I must have <laughs> just simply run out of ideas. I used to be a rather um, proud of my titling capabilities and used to spend a certain amount of time yeah. thinking of titles and making sure the title actually fit the painting that it was the title for. And for some reason, it just didn't happen this time. So I resorted to a very uh, time honored uh, strategy of just using numbers. Somehow the numbers got all out of whack, but anyway, it kind of makes <laughs> sense. Yes, because the numbers back in the day would be sequential as to when you finished the work. Right. Um, and then it would be, or it would be untitled and then a number, which right. I always thought was just curious, just give it a number. But a tree of life at least is something which unifies it. We'll talk about that kind of represent uh, that that titling in a second. I'm sorry, the cat has already joined me. He joins me every Zoom for some reason. That's that's slate. Um, so here's the first gallery of the exhibition uh, with this large painting that's visible from the front. And then on either side, uh, two portrait format works. Um, and basically the works come in two forms. There are some low and wide panoramic landscape format works uh, that have a comprehensive image. And then some of the vertically oriented portrait format works have a lower section, which sometimes is a separate panel and sometimes is not. Um, a couple of the horizontal works have that as well, but uh, we will show you a variety of them as we go. And maybe just start with Tree of Life 17 here, the first picture that you see from 2021 and talk a little bit about, you know, what was the impetus for developing this kind of imagery and was it something that was sort of gestating uh, you know for, really, for I, some time? I, I think we maybe we should go to one of the paintings with the bottom panel to start Okay. With, because there, sure. this in a way is an outlier. The, yeah. The, the, the ones that have the bottom panel is actually the idea. And then there's some very okay. on the idea, but if we are good at one okay, of so we'll, the ones. We'll that do one, that. How about this start one? With this one. First, I also want to say a disclaimer, which I'm sure every painter who has ever been on this program has ever done a Zoom presentation has made this similar disclaimer, which is that the paintings look terrible on the screen. The, even, the, even the official gallery photographer and the, the gallery's website, they're, they're very carefully controlled, released images of the installation look terrible. They look washed out, they have no sense of dimensionality, yeah. the colors are or a, a fraction of the intensity of their in real life. This is, of course, what every single painter would say. I don't see any reason to be different in this regard. Um, I would encourage people who are able to get uptown to please go see them in real life. It's quite a different experience. Oh, just but one little side of the galleries are just on the corner of Madison, not on Lex. It's, it's 79. I'm sorry, you're right. I apologize. Yes, Madison yes, Avenue, of course. Madison. But I, only, I only spent nine years around the corner at the Institute of Fine Arts doing my PhD. I should remember that, but anyway. Well, that's probably why. But, but, <laughs> so, but those disclaimers aside, what this, this painting is the typical of the series in that what you're looking at are two different pictorial languages the, the cartoon languages of the figures on top of which is superimposed a, a different graphic language of a stylized tree. And the third language was underneath the, what might be called a predella panel is both literally and figuratively what's underneath the surface of the earth. So we get to see the tree above ground simultaneously with the roots of the tree reaching into the soil or the metaphoric soil or the symbolic soil of the painting. Well, there are three interlocking or, and or superimposed uh, kind of conditions that I'm asking a lot with the viewer. The eye has to 
work to find some way of integrating, or rather I should say, well, the painting has done the work, the viewer has to simply, you know, come along for the ride. But that's, that's the basic structure. There was, uh, I, I recently heard from Hal Foster, uh, a, a, a quote from Andre Breton, which I'd never heard before. If I'd heard it, I'd forgotten it, which is that the ideal uh, surrealist work is a man cut in half by a window, which is a kind of beautiful image. It made me realize that these, these are paintings cut in half by a tree. So that one of the first things you learn if you take a very flat footed two dimensional design class or any kind of art class in school, one of the first rules of composition is never to divide the rectangle in half, either vertically or horizontally, always divide it unevenly because dividing something in half, making a line in the middle, it more or less makes the space go dead. So of course, being the contrary that I am, all, most of these paintings are built around the idea that the, the painting is bisected pretty much right down the middle by this tree. I had been interested in the cartoon language of Peter Arno, the guy who drew all the original cartoons. I'm just borrowing them. Uh, they're all his characters, his invention, his language. Um, I, uh, I, got, I obtained permission from the estate for his daughter who's still alive to use his, his, these characters in the paintings. Um, and I'll go into that later, why they're paintable, why they're usable as material. But I was involved in the, the language of the black, white, and gray encircled by a black outline, black brush stroke, I should say. I've worn it for a while, and I don't even remember what the impetus was, but at a certain point, I superimposed this very stylized tree on top of the Arna figures, and as almost as if a, as if, almost as if on a dare. I like, bet you can't do this, and it had some magical alchemical effect. It had some kind of multiplier effect. The combination of the two pictorial languages was was infinitely richer than either one on its own. That's how the series series got underway. And as you look at these, you can see the Arno uh, illustrations or the, are always underneath the tree and the foliage and the material on the top. But I just want to point out that what you're seeing in this particular work, number 13, and I want to note that through the presentation, I put titles for all the works, but oftentimes I left out the tree of life because of space so that images, woeful as they may be, can be big as possible. So keep in mind, everything's titled Tree of Life with a number here, Tree of Life number 13. But just to point out that the Arno image here of the nude woman seen from behind, and then the figure here with the door uh, doorman or the valet or something here on the left are from two different cartoons. These are kind of mashups. Sometimes they're comprehensive, David, right? Sometimes you, yeah. you've sort of bifurcated them, bisected, yeah, the, I've, with I've, the taken, tree. I've taken the cast of characters as Arno created, but mostly yeah. I've, I, I've rearranged things sometimes yeah. considerably. And the tree is an interesting occlusive device. I mean, sometimes it covers faces. Sometimes it, it points out things uh, on bodies. Uh, it seems to, you, you know, uh, oftentimes it envelops uh, the form. So they, they are speaking to each other. Um, and usually the tree is in the center but we'll see there's a couple examples uh, like the one behind you in the studio where the trees are almost like framing devices right. on either on either side. And then there's figure forms in the middle and then they integrate with this lower section, which you see um, there. The medium for most of these is uh, oil and acrylic on linen. And um, I was saying it was kind of an interesting uh, mashup also of media using acrylic, using oil. I tried to take like here on the right, a couple of details to sort of point that out, that fluidity of the acrylic, which seems to meld nicely with Arno's, um, you know, ink ink lines that he's yeah. using with a brush. And then the, the more um, uh, meaty uh, use of the oil on the surface, which you can kind of see there on the right, that's this detail here mm. of the picture. You're talking about, is this something that you've done before? Use the two, uh, 
yeah, two paint mediums I'll, together? I'll, often, it's not something that I'm using them together. I use acrylic as a, a base layer, as a, the back, mm -hmm. let's call it the background or the, the sketch. The, or acrylic is kind of a map. It's a way of getting the image down quickly, getting it down mm -hmm. with a minimum of fuss. There's very little, um, um, what to say, there's very little one color dragged into another color, the kind of things that are part right. of the oil painting. It's, the edges are crisp, the, the surface is flat, it goes down quickly and allows me to see what, not what the painting is going to be ultimately, but gives me, allows me to see what the um, choreography uh, of the paint, the bones of the choreography, so to speak, are, are done with acrylic. When that's, once that's done, I put it away and mm -hmm. then come back to it. And then also, I mean, almost every case, not in every case, almost every case, the acrylic figures were painted with the tree already described as a, you know, as a negative space. So, right. um, but once those things are, once it's mapped out and laid down, I put it away. Then when I come back to it, it's as if it's a found object. Then I'm responding to it as, even though I made it, so it's something that I found with the requisite detachment and um, uh, kind of curiosity about that I, I don't have any reservations about fucking it up. Or, right. or whatever happens to it, right. it's all it's all fair game at that point. And there's and that, that, that really there, there's no technical reason to break up the process that way. It's more psychological or procedural. There's something about the distance, the doing it first one way and then redoing it another way affords me. I, I probably don't I don't have to do it that way, but I got it something that became a kind of procedural habit. I, I think there's I think some subliminal thing is gained by it. There is some nice, just as like pure painter talk that might interest no one. There's some nice interplay between the flat acrylic grays and the brushy oil grays because they're, the, the, the pigment works very differently um, in your eye. Uh, yeah. the, the acrylic is acrylic. Acrylic looks the way it does because it's chemically made a certain way and oil is very, very different. So the intermingling of those things is kind of interesting just optically, but probably must be able to even know it, notice it. It's, it, it's more like um, shorthand and longhand or longhand yeah. and, you know, it's just speaking and typing. Some, there's some reciprocity between those two things. And the drying time is different. So, you know, if you say that you're putting down certain bits or, po or portions, the oil will take longer to dry than the Oh yeah, well, of course, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, everything else about it's totally different. The way the edges, yeah, the yeah, result yeah. of all that kind of stuff is different. It's that, yeah. I mean, I think of them as mostly as oil paintings, for whatever it's worth, mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with some, you know, acrylic bits showing through here and there. What about the underdrawing? So I'm showing you a detail here of the, the leaves at the top right, and you can see some drawing in this section here. Um, did you do you project images? Or are you just doing it freehand? No, well, there's all the, all, all the all the platforms. Most of the platforms are drawn freehand. Some of them are actually drawn from life, things from the garden, or they're maybe I've made mm -hmm. a sketch even in situ from the garden, and then I'm looking at the sketch and drawing it on the on the canvas of charcoal. I, this is a temperamental more of a kind of a disposition. I try to approach the painting, even though the in this particular series, the paintings have follow a template and they all have great similarity one to another, however, at the same time. Yeah. I try to approach it yeah. in a non-programmatic way. So, right. I, and it's come to, can be expressed in very simple terms. Some, sometimes it almost sounds so trivial. Why would you even care? But for example, I didn't want to make every platform filled in. Some of them are outlined and filled in the way a cartoon would be. Some of them are drawn yeah. more naturalistically the way, let's quote unquote, a real artist would draw them. And some of them are drawn yeah, like and some of them are drawn and painted the way, let's say Picasso would have done it. And they're, yeah. I'm using the whole palette, no pun intended, of, of ways of mark making and ways of image making 
in one painting, I, I'm trying not to be too prescribed about what's going to happen. So sometime in that in that particular instance, as I'm sure anyone who's ever made a painting can relate to this sensation, I drew those leaves fully intending to paint them in. And when I drew them, realized, you know what, they're done. So yeah, <laughs> I didn't, I don't map the paintings out to, to a degree where I know everything that's going to happen. All I know is the basic structure. And from then on, anything goes and, and, and they can change a lot. And sometimes, uh, I mean, not sometimes, often things are done which seem like a mistake. And there are, there could be a mistake, but what they do is compel me to keep going forward. And that, you know, getting, this is really not explicit to me, is I think many, many people work this way and people, people have talked about working this way. You get yourself into a jam, into a corner, and then you, the, the painting is a, a process of figuring out how to escape, how to be, you know, escape the sort of trap you've fallen, you've allowed yourself to fall into. Mm. Are you working on multiple pictures at once in the studio? Yeah, I yeah, remember they're, them going. The paintings are so complicated. They take such a long time. There's even though I, yeah. I, hopefully I say this, I say this hopefully, um, they work on have, they have an immediate eye grabbing wall power. The you know, reaching that state of resolution sometimes takes months. And and, mm -hmm. and it just I just have to live with them for a long time. In that, during that time, I'm not idle. I mean, I just start other ones, go into other ones. So typically in my studio, there are four or five paintings in progress. And I just kind of go around the room and work a little bit on this one until I'm stuck. And then I work on another one until I'm stuck on that one. And hopefully yeah. after a period of time, they've all kind of steeped together. And it's sort of like making dinner. If you're, if you're trying to make a multi-course dinner, trying to make everything come out you know, to put on, get everything on the table at the same time. It's, it takes a lot of right. <laughs> right. So we'll talk a little bit about the imagery in a bit, but there's oftentimes a kind of uh, disconnect between the two sides, the figures. There's a lot of uh, gender uh, issues that come up in some of these images. And uh, there was a lot of that in Arno's work anyway. Um, Peter Arno is an interesting character. There's a big article about him by Ben Schwartz in Vanity Fair from 2016 called The Double Life of Peter Arno. He was quite a character, um, lived a very flamboyant life uh, coming from a world privilege and, and higher education um, and designing for the New Yorker for, for ages and ages. The one on the left here reads, gee, Mr. Payson, mere words can't express my appreciation, I guess. And here the, the lamp is, the thing that bifurcates the composition and shows, you know, a, a, th there's wonderful formal qualities in his cartooning, um, which shows you this sort of disconnect. And then he did a number of works which uh, paid attention to the art world in the city at the time. And here is one from 1961. His spatter is masterful, but his dribbles lack conviction. Mm. The critic getting it in there. And these are people who are looking at some kind of pseudo Pollux. Um, so the Arno stuff is great fodder um, for uh, thinking about sexual politics and culture in the period with this uh, incredibly um, genteel white world that he sort of lived in at the time and was and was kind of documenting. Um, is this is this something that sort of intrigued you for a long time? These cartoons in particular? I, not really, I have to say. First of all, I. Yeah, I, yeah. I try not to know. I do know a fair amount about Piano at this point, and he and he certainly was an interesting character. But I try not to yeah. know too much about him or be too interested in him for myself. I mean, I could be yeah. him. I, I mean, for myself as a painter, as a as a private citizen, I could find him very interesting. I don't want to mm -hmm. carry a lot of that with me into the studio. First thing, I I don't. His cartoons aren't funny. I mean, the, I think they're better without the captions, and the captions never right. never very good. There, it's, <laughs> it's the New Yorker sensibility, but from a much much earlier time. I mean, he lived until the '60s, but Arno was one of the very first people associated with the magazine, going back to the late '20s. Yeah, this is this is you know ancient history for most of us. Right. Um, the reason that I was initially attracted to Arno, without even realizing who had made the image, 
it wasn't, it, it, was a, it was some detail in a painting that preceded this current series by several years. I simply saw, I do a lot of research in design annual 1936 kind of thing. I think I have probably spent more time looking at graphic design, presentational. I'm interested in the language of presentation and in all of its manifestations. And it, in my opinion, it reached a high point of inventiveness, of, of visual wit, of, of real sophisticated visual communication, not so much in art, but in commercial art and illustration and graphic design and so forth from the 1920s is when it starts. When basically the 20s is the invention of the popular, popular press and the invention basically celebrities is, is, is an invention of the 1920s. But it really gets underway in the 30s and by the 40s it's, in, it's just cooking. And then, by the, and then pretty much by the 60s it's done. And then, <laughs> excuse me, but illustration for many years, for decades, was king. I mean, an illustrator could, could really be a star and make a lot of money and have a real following. I mean, you all, you all will recall that Andy Warhol started life as an illustrator. Mm. Photography killed illustration, obviously, but by the, by the mid 60s, illustration was dead. Why? Photography became ubiquitous. But for those decades, from the 20s to the early 60s, illustration was a kind of it was it was like the internet it was the it was the way people connected with the culture um yeah. in, a, in, a, in a way of participating in the culture so arno was one of the inventors of this um kind of sophistication so I, w when i saw something in a design annual an image of a, of a couple sitting there and I, I thought, oh, I, can, I think I can use that. The reason I thought I could use that was nothing to do with Arno, nothing to do with gender politics, but because I, he was a very sophisticated graphic artist, he understood how to divide the image into black, white, and gray, had different, different tones of gray. And the black right. outline is not just a black outline. It's a brushstroke. It's a brushstroke with character. I remember my art teacher when I was, 10 always used to say don't forget a, a line is also a shape well i had to think about that i thought about that for decades every line is also, is also a shape i mean you can say it to people all you want to but only but very few people actually can practice it arno was one of those people i don't even know where he got it i don't think he ever had i don't think he was formally trained he just kind of had, was a genius so every line is of shape and every figure is a really a, a beautifully orchestrated um, interplay of, of lights and darks. Those are the things that can be painted. And that has nothing to do with cartooning. There's nothing to do with social commentary. That's like pure art stuff. If it hadn't been for that, I, I don't think I would have been interested in Arno for one, you know, one minute. Once, once I realized that, then I did some investigation and I realized Oh, this guy is just a gold mine, and he did, he sort of did everything, and that's when I made you know contact with his his daughter who's who's ninety one and still alive, and um, you know there there is so okay, but but your question, Jason, is more about the content and the the milieu that would, that he's depicting, which of course is it both is us and it's extremely distant from us, and I think that's. Right part of what's interesting about it. I mean, I'm, I'm older than you and probably older than anybody watching this right now. So I remember, <laughs> I remember this world, even though it wasn't my world, it wasn't my parents' world, but I remember that it existed. And I remember mm -hmm. that in a way it was some aspirational quality. And I, I, what I remember was that I, life was organized around these paradigms, even if one's own life didn't resemble it particularly. The, um, I mean, I, I was raised as a figurative artist. I was doing life drawing since I was a little kid and all that kind of stuff, but I never, I'm just simply not that good. I would never be able to make 
figures that are so animated and so um, uh, interactive on the conversational level as as Arno's figures. I mean, they're always their mouths are always open. Someone's mouths are always open in Arno cartoon. They're always yeah. Someone's you can hear the you know someone's always got an opinion. Or someone's always saying the wrong thing. Someone's always taking umbrage. So that just gave me a lot of stuff to work with that I probably would not be able to, you know, arrive at any other way. The I think it's I think sorry, it's really interesting. Rich. Go ahead. Finish I was gonna say the, the gender politics of it I thought were interesting, partly because two things which seemingly are contradictory, but I think they're true simultaneously, partly because no one behaves like this anymore. And partly because people still behave like this, and it's right that different. What is <laughs> what's interesting about Arno, among other things, is that the the men are almost always the butt of the joke. I mean, in, in almost every case, the man is clueless. Yeah, says the wrong thing, does the wrong thing, makes the wrong conclusion, and it is not terribly different from, although you know. It, not quite the same level, but not that terribly different from, let's say, the kinds of male-female dynamics that you find in a in Renaissance drama, find in Shakespeare comedy. These are these are very very minute vignettes that could be mm -hmm. in the world of the comedy of mistaken identity and the comedy of yeah. of you know self misrepresentation and you know, who do you think I am and why, or why don't you think I'm this other thing? Uh, people try. It's interesting to, to think about it, like in within the context of the readership of the New Yorker and who was looking at these things, which is, you know, there are a lot of women working there, but I, probably the readership was largely male. Um, and also the way that it relates to. I don't know to, about that. I think, I, think yeah. I don't know the demographics of it. I'd be interesting to know. I, yeah, we have, to, we have to look I, that up. I have a feeling it was very, uh, you know, Everybody read it. I don't think it was. I don't, yeah, I don't think interesting. It, uh, you know, it wasn't what I'm talking about. They also, yeah, they also remind me of like French cartoons from the 19th century that lampooned the salons, where you had people, men and women, looking at works in the salon, Manet's work, and commenting on them. And it totally comes out well, of that. Well, this was well, this, yeah, this is a trope of of the sophisticated modern life. There, there is yeah. the artist is a. Uh, artist is a character of fun. Artist is a, right. a character of sport, and that's that's a wonderful, especially if you're an artist. It's a wonderful trope to be able to play with. That, mm. um, yeah, yeah. Of course, the artist is misunderstood and, in some way, ridiculed. In some way, you know, the pretensions are are are, are poked. Through and I think I, I mean that you know who who does who's not who doesn't like that that's, I think it's kind of very winning, um, yeah. the self-deprecating. Yeah, I take a little bit of also, take a little bit of air out of it. Yeah, yeah, but also I I also really interested by your comment about how illustration falls off the cliff in the 1960s, um, but it feels like to me and this is a conversation for another time it moves somewhere else. Um, because cartooning goes into comics and comic books at the, in the 1960s become the new medium, really. And we're still living it, with it today. The Marvel Universe, the DC yeah, Universe, yeah, it but, all comes out of that. So the transition is really interesting. But this is a very good and point. a very different audience. It's a very good point, Jason. I, I think that, I mean, apart from a few isolated figures, like, like our Crumb, obviously, and probably a few others, I'm not, I'm not mm. a comic book person. I'm not a, mm. I'm not a aficionado of comics in the least. I never have been, not yeah. even when I was a little kid. Um, but it seems to me that the world of illustration and, and the world of comics are very different in tone, intention, mm. uh, level of artistic sophistication. Uh, yeah, there's some overlap things in common. They're both done with pen and ink, but the problem with comics, in my opinion, is that the there's never any interesting distortion. Even the monsters are totally realistic. You know, if you, I, I, I because of Arno, I've been buying all these books about on, on, 
on how to draw cartoons, especially the the um, you know the, the very contemporary ones, the action figures and whatnot. The emphasis is on um, you know very convincing, realistic, quote unquote, mm. representation of of uh, stuff, and um, it's very very boring. It's very I mean, as art, it's very boring. There's no, yeah. there's nothing even remote, remotely approaching the, you know, the level of distortion that one might say in a, in a, in, the, in a Picasso sketchbook. I mean, it's like they've never heard of Picasso. So it's, it's it really, I mean, I know, I know I'm speaking of <laughs> heresy here. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the Jack Kirby fans out there might might. Uh, yeah, but Jack Kirby is Jack stuff. Kirby is the great case in point. Jack Kirby is a hundred and ten percent classical artist. He would yeah. not be able yeah. to run and make a distorted figure if he put a gun to his head. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Milt, Milt Caniff was a wonderful artist. Jack Kirby is wonderful. Yeah. There are many many wonderful artists, but they were a hundred percent academic traditionalists, yeah. and, and right. they were completely unacquainted with modernism. It's very, it's all yeah. a complete bifurcation in a way. Yeah, they tamp it all down. Let's talk about the theme Tree of Life quickly and then get to some more of the works. Um, you know, Tree of Life, I put up a couple of images here. On the right, uh, it's just reminded me of my childhood in Trenton, New Jersey, um, in a Jewish community there out of Israel. And my grandfather who sort of took care of everything at mm -hmm. the, uh, at the shul um, was tasked with making a big Tree of Life design for the atrium of the synagogue. And I remember going to Lambertville, New Jersey to the founders to get all the material that they were making this great bronze tree. And yeah. then there were the leaves which had, which had the names of individuals, people who had died, donations, et cetera, you know, remembrances and that sort of dominated the whole lobby of the synagogue. And now that addeth like every other synagogue in downtown Trenton has moved to the suburbs there in Lawrence, Israel now, but also made me think of, I don't know if this had any, impact on you, the depth in these works is significant. The horror of the Tree of Life uh, synagogue shooting in October of 2018 in Pittsburgh, when uh, 12, 13 people were killed and two were injured and four police were injured at anti-Semitism in the age of Trump, um, which continues today. And, you know, that that theme of the, the, the sort of mythical dimension of uh, this term or this phrase is, is very strong in Judaism. And of course, elsewhere in, uh, Yggdrasil, Norse tree of life, um, and you know, obviously the Garden of Eden in Judeo-Christian Muslim culture. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly wasn't thinking about any current events aspect, and I was, certainly wasn't thinking about any any um, thing connected with Judaism per se. I think mm -hmm. is, is, I think it's a fairly universal symbol. I, I, I can't swear that every religion has a version of it, but I certainly wouldn't be surprised I, if anything, I was thinking about something I probably saw a long, long time ago from Shaker culture. I think, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it plays a big role in Shaker iconography. Beyond that, I can't really say too much. I don't have any great story to tell about the, the you know, intense desire to connect with this ancient, symbol. I mean, I'm, I'm aware that it's a, a, I'm very attracted to the idea that it's a, it's a symbol that it goes way, very, very far back and keeps showing up in lots of different guises. Um, yeah, Tom, Tom McGlynn in the, in the chat mentions Terrence Malick's wonderfonderfully poetic film, Tree of Life. Yeah. That sort of I mean, idea that yeah, I mean, Tree of Life, the film is one of the I think one of the few, certainly in our era, one of the few truly religious films mm -hmm. that is also a great film. It's also a masterpiece. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's an incredible film. And I, I'm, I'm sure I had uh, Malik's title in the back of my head when I used, when I took it, but it's not, but it obviously predates Terrence Malik, you know, by eons. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it, I mean, it literally came from a magazine assignment. I was trying to think of a context in which to present Scarlett Johansson, weirdly enough. And all I could think of, all I could think of was to make this tree of life and have Scarlett 
posed in the tree on tree limbs and hanging from tree branches and somehow a tree populated with different versions of Scarlett Johansson. And we did a mock-up of it and it looked terrible. It was a disaster. I said, Fine. <laughs> so that, was a, that was a terrible idea. Let's do something else. But the idea was stuck with me. And then about a year later, I started the series of paintings. Hmm. So here are a couple of examples from the show, um, number 14 and number 25, where you have a really extraordinary interplay between the tree above. Sometimes there's this caterpillar-like form that in the case of the painting on the left forms a kind of a question with the heart-like um, leaf here below it, a question mark that's clearly subconscious <laughs> thing. Um, but it, often the trees have a real wonderful curvature and then the way they envelop the figures who seem to read as being in the background behind. And then of course they link with elements below in the predellas. And the predellas are far less consistent in these works than the upper sections, I would say. Although sometimes like in the image on the right, the upper sections, the figures might have some color quality to them as opposed to the monochromatic blacks and grays and whites that you see on the left. But the predellas are all different um, in terms of style and symbolism and iconography. Um, here you have a crown, a little remind me of Basquiat kind of form. And then I don't know what this is. <laughs> Acanthus leaves, this feels like, which are very classical in form. And this one's sort of busting up through into the top. And then it also makes a little play with the flowers here on the right. And the spikes of the, um, the crown are reflected in this sort of bucket here, whatever this is, on the left from the cartoon-like form. So there's a lot of interplay between uh, heaven and hell or top and bottom uh, in, in, in these works. The, the formal qualities are, are really alluring. I've been a couple times and it's just great to look at them, essentially. And the scene on the right, I mean, I, I, you know, oftentimes it's, it's a great challenge for people like myself, art historians, to try to figure out if there's any um, direct reference um, in your pictures to particular works. And of course, often there is. Um, in uh, American art and Renaissance art and all kinds of things, but I couldn't figure out what was going on here. These figures. Yeah, it's it's on very, the bot, bottom it's very right. hard to read. It's some sort of domestic altercation. And yeah. There's a couple, a man and a woman are having a, some sort of confrontation, and he has a hold of her by her hair. And mm -hmm. also, that's about all we can tell. It's not good, whatever it is. And it's probably better that whatever is going on there is happening underground, because that's, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. really want, you don't really want to see its surface. But though it's also the way the image is embedded in this striated, horizontally streaked uh, background, which is, seems to be where the roots are emerging from. And it has also to do with the scale. If you look at the, way, at the size of those images relative to the size of the characters above ground, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a not yet another kind of disjunction. So I would say the feeling tone of this particular picture is rather dire it has to do mm. with that charged image which is only partly fleshed out you can you can see the outline of the back of her garment but then it's she kind of disappears yeah and the uh, and the the colors of the characters above ground are like the, like the colors of German Expressionist painting, but they're not painted expressionistically. They're painted kind of schematically and uncomfortably. I would say the color fits uncomfortably, mm. or provocatively together. And the tree itself is, is has the aspect of like a figure out of no theater. It's a kind of tree that's almost speaking, almost, it's almost has the lines. And the leaves, the color of the leaves contradict everything I've just said. So oh. there, there's a sweetness and a, they're, the, they're like the colors of macaroons from La Durée. And <laughs> the, the expression on the woman's face, again, is a kind of incomprehension. She's frightened. Well, if, she's also seems frightened. There's the, well, there's the, the well, threat of violence, I guess. I mean, you could, I'm, I'm not sure, but I agree with that, Jason. I think there's, 
I mean, of course, you can read into it as you wish, but I think yeah, it's more appealing of what, what, what's going on. We don't, and we don't know what the connection is between the guy on the left and the woman on the right. Is there any connection? Yeah. Maybe she's not not seeing him. She just happens to be in the same painting. We don't know who. We don't really yeah. know who what. So there is a sense of premonition. There's a gravitas to the whole, the literally the gravity of the painting moving down through space, the, the undulation of the tree as if the, through the hips of a dancer, let's say even a, I would say, say like a Cambodian classical dancer, um, all which are in- Contrapasto tree, it's a tree in Contrapasto. Tree in Contrapasto that, and yet, and yet the painting, even though we're talking about all these different stuff, it's rather limited. The means with the ingredients of the painting are, are not many. It's a it's a it's a rather you know simple yeah. Guyabez. It's not one of it's not a magnum opus. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm rather fond of this picture. I kind of I kind of I think it kind of works. This the yeah. squeakiness of the blue as it moves through that that is yeah both related to and but moving the opposite direction from the streakiness down below. There's, it's kind of a, an object lesson in how I look at paintings, not just that I've made it, but uh, how I like to look at paintings. I like paintings that, that move my eye continually and unexpectedly through the painting in different directions at different velocities. There's also a sense of velocity and, and time in the painting Arrest both the rested time in the, the scene of the domestic altercation and then continuous time, continuous viewing time. And the way that the way the two things link together to me is a is a great interest. Does that make any sense? Yeah. yeah it, does, it totally does. And it works very well in this picture because you you know you have your sort of vertical flow of the tree and then the solidity of the characters above and then the horizontal streams at the bottom, but it all become gels together. Just to tell people the idea of a predella, if those, those of you out there who are not so familiar with this uh, antique technique in the history of art, just an example, uh, Gentile da Fabriano's Adoration of the Magi is a wonderful example of international Gothic style, 1423. And you have the main scene here, and then below in these altarpieces, you would have a predella, maybe one image, or in this case, three images, which are part of the story, uh, predecessors to the story, um, the nativity, okay. the flight into Egypt, these kinds of things, it's which pre- relate to the image above. Yes, it's the, it's the prequel or the sequel. I mean, it's it's cartoon. Yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah, totally what it is. Yeah, and it's a Renaissance technique, which was then taken up by artists of the 19th century, like Dante Gabriel Rossetti, one of the great Pre-Raphaelite painters. His famous poem, "The Blessed Damozel" from 1847, which he turned into a series of paintings. This one, the prime version at the fog in uh, at Harvard, uh, with this image of the uh, woman, uh, the beloved in heaven, um, deceased, surrounded by all these sort of uh, embracing lovers, stars around her head, three angels below, um, and then in the bottom, in the predella, is the grounded lover, the man who is wistfully mourning her passing on real earth and dreaming of her in heaven above. So it's almost like an emanation of his imagination uh, below. And then there was- well, it's funny, Jason, I, I've never seen this painting before and I, I, I'm, I'm virtually ignorant about pre-Raphaelite painting in general. I've never really liked it. So I've never done much looking at it, but I mean, this painting is the, the, the uh, composition and the diagrammatic Part of it is, is is amazingly related to what I've been doing, and I've, I've never seen it before. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not the hugest fan of Rossetti, but he nailed it with this one. Yeah. And uh, when he worked hard on something, he could get it right. And he was a fantastic designer, draftsman, mm. um, uh, illustrations. Um, he was terrific at that. The painting, I don't think you'd necessarily like the surface if you saw it in person. Yeah. Um, but the design, the design really works. Yeah, Here's another example of one of these predellas, Tree of Life 19, uh, with this uh, extraordinary image of a ladder, which creeps up frequently in these works. And also should just to point out that the lower section is painted on cotton toweling, um, which as you explained last night, we're in the gallery, it's 
basically rags that are used to clean brushes in the studio that you then um, put onto the panel and uh, used as the lower section and painted with a very rough kind of quality as opposed to the smoothness of uh, the linen above. Mm -hmm. The latter has a symbolic function in these pictures. Yeah, I, I, it sounds so dopey to say it out loud, but it, <laughs> it, I thought that there should be a ladder in case one wanted to try, you know, go up from the underworld above ground or vice versa as the case may be. Mm. So that that's why the ladder's there. If anyone wants to climb up, I think I think that's part of the whole mythology of heaven and hell is that there there always is a ladder or there's steps or there's an elevator or there's a there's some you know yeah. the, ascension, the ascension it has to be uh, accomplished in some way some some physical way so that ladder is easiest way yeah. to get there. Mm. And in this one, you have the trees as framing elements, but then the inter creepy interlocking branches denuded of leaves um, who are kind of uh, reflecting or paralleling the scene that you see uh, in the background of these two figures. Yeah, the trees are- And it made me- They're, re they're really dopey. They're really like, like 19th, century, <laughs> 19th century ballerina arms. They're, they're pretty, pretty silly. Yeah. I was thinking about this interconnection between the lower section and the upper section and the latter and an idea of being to go being able to go from one uh, to the other, like, you know, something out of Stranger Things, um, where you can go into another world. And it reminded me of these, uh, this fantastic Romanesque tympanum from San Lazar and Otun, maybe by Gislabertus, The Last Judgment, where you have this fantastic lower section, essentially a predella called a lintel where you have uh, figures emerging from sarcophagi that are lined up here at the bottom, right. shaking and shivering and cold and naked because they've just been resurrected. And then in this example here, you have hands that are pulling them up through the ceiling essentially to be judged by uh, the angel and the devil, St. Michael and the devil. I'll yeah. show you a detail here. St. Michael and the devil and this figure is being pulled up um, to be put on the scales to weigh his soul, whether he should be saved or not, but that idea of moving back and forth from the underworld and yeah. above and uh, and finding this cartoonish landscape above, I think is, is quite potent and the sort of disconnect between realms in these pictures. Mm -hmm. Also, it seems like the lower sections often are um, formative in a way that they are reflective of particular styles I was walking through with my friend Andrew Cronenberg who went to grad school with me as art advisor and we were trying to figure out you know what styles these kind of represent um, and which artists and clearly there's an element to it which goes to uh, action painting the New York school gestural art the sort of uh, fulcrum or, or the beginning really of, uh, of, a, of a contemporary art in America um, and these kind of sections here and this detail from number six, which made me think of, you know, Frankenthal or mountains mm -hmm. and sea uh, staining and splattering and these kinds of things. So, you know, how would you characterize your relationship to the New York school as a kind of formative influence um, right. in, your, in your career? Yeah, good question. Uh, well, first of all, I would say in general, this Pradell panel, when we talked about it a little bit, how it's used, it, it, in my mind, it, it's meant to, I don't want to say it's not a symbol, it, it's simply a representation of both the unconscious and the past. And the past could be my past, or it could be uh, um, you know, autobiographical, or it could be cultural or shared past, and or our, the past, arts past, let's say art history. My relationship with art history in particular is very much centered around the New York School. It's something I always identified with from a very early age and still do to a certain extent. It is literally my roots. So ergo, when I'm showing the thing that nurtures the tree, the roots that nurture the thing from which the roots draw the nutrients, which then nourishes the tree, one of those things is the very ethos of the New York school and certain mm. earmarks of how those trains were made and what they looked like. 
and I like as if as if I as if I want to say. I mean, I never want to say about a thing. That's what I want to say, but I'm going to do it now. <laughs> that as if I'm wanting to say, I never want to lose sight of these things. I never want to. You know, my tree's planted here, and it, its roots are here. Um, I did it very spontaneously, making these some of these bottom panels as stain paintings on the floor. I mean, not, not terribly different from the way Helen would have done it, I mean, with different intention, obviously. But, but yeah. the, you know, the, the technique is the same. And it gives you lots of different things, one of which is this point of reference. But the other thing is just gives you velocity and gives you a lyricism and hmm. sense of detail, the way the very small drops of color, the flings of color, um, Counterpoint, or, you know, work in a counterpoint to the things above ground. The the bottom panels. Sorry, I'm not being articulate. The bottom panels counterpoint to the top panels in many different ways. One of which is purely formal, just scale, movement, mm -hmm. the direction, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I do. I'm going to digress and tell you an anecdote. Mm -hmm. the, the first time I met Richard Serra, which is probably over 40 years ago, I think I was just starting to show my work, just starting to become known in some way, some small way. I think I was on a panel, the Art Forum magazine organized with like the kids, of which I was one, and then some other people, of which Richard was one, and I'd never met Richard Serra before. And if you know Richard Serra, you know, he's the two things about him. One, he's very pugnacious and he's very brilliant. So he got kind of exercised that night and kind of cornered me, even, even the, you know, pointing the finger in the chest kind of thing. And he said, I know what you guys are up to. I know what you're up to, Sally. You're just trying to combine Pollock and Warhol. And I thought, oh, fuck you, man. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, what do I care? <laughs> the idea, well, there's two things to say. First is, for many years, let's say decades, eons, artists thought in terms of that progression, in the sense of, you know, this artist, this camp represents this, and this camp represents the step after this, and then so on and so forth. So that you had to figure out where you stood in the lineage and the progression no one really thinks like that anymore but that was a, that was what animated the conversation around art so here's the point of the story even though i instantly rejected what richard said just out of a kind of psychological need i may have subsequently realized that it was pretty brilliant analysis and he's not incorrect <laughs> and there's something right. really to it because what does that really mean? It means trying to forge a link, of trying to forge a way of kind of coexistence, a rapprochement of, of an interpenetration between the world of imagery and the world of all over abstraction. What could be more different? What could have less to do with each other? And, if, and yet somehow quixotically, if you could make those two things interlace, where they somehow each retain their own identity, but they are literally pulsating back and forth in the same field of reference. Wouldn't that be interesting? And I feel like that's, in, in fact, Richard was right. That's what I've spent the last 45 years trying to do. So you right. see it, I mean, very much literalized in these paintings. Some of the Predella panels are the abstract painting and then the above panels are the figurative painting. And, and they have to work together. They have to be, they have to figure out a way to, to play together. Right. So but it you. doesn't solve that. You know, it's not one, it's, it's not the singular no. reading, which is the no, really great thing about it. Yeah, it, of course. It's, 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 I mean, I, as I said, I just use one element. Offer as, as an amusing actor. But, it's, yeah. but yeah. It, it does, I think, lead us in a certain direction that's not an yeah. I think that these operate well in that sense. And, um, you know, they're very hard to pin down. There's a lot of detachment and collaging of elements, but 
they're also very readable in a way that you know a lot of your work is is less uh, visibly clear, I guess you could say in that sense. Doesn't mean it's doesn't mean it's um, it's narratively clear. No, that's why it's interesting because of the complexity. Um, but visually, you can you can get it. And the wonderful thing about these, I think, is uh, that they're not bifurcated, you know, like horizontally in the middle. Yeah. These you can see them as a whole. You can see them as a totality yeah. straight away, and then try to make sense of them. And your eye moves around and finds colors like it does when you look at a Pusan, it, it operates in a similar way. And at the same time, you have these elements, uh, like a, almost like a Rothko color field picture where you have you know, these different segments, which are geometric, uh, which are organized in a certain way. I mean, that, that's the subtleness, subtleness of it at the same time that it has this sort of brazen cartooning on the upper section. Um, we're so used, I think, we're so used to looking at the abstract qualities of the lower section. Mm. The upper section looks more radical in a way, I think, yeah. you know, even in well, the context of your of. Right, well, you know, there's, there's this wonderful thing that, um, that Fairfield Porter said a long time ago, I said that, that um, you should judge an abstract painting by its, by its content and you should judge a realist yeah. painting by its, by its uh, you know, by its form. You know, by by its uh, um, uh, you know by its uh, you know in a purely you know abstract what kind of way, in the reverse of what its head. most people would yeah. have, think of it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, anyway, thanks, Jason. I mean, that was a lovely <laughs> analysis. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'll take it. Let me let me show a couple other things, and then I want to move to questions because I know people want some questions. <laughs> the one thing I was thinking about in terms of trees, contemporary art. Uh, systematic sort of ways of thinking about the past is, of course, Ad Reinhardt's mar marvelous series of illustrations, one from 1946 and one from 1961. This is the earlier one, How to Look at Modern Art in America. If you haven't seen this before, you should, because it's, it's this idea uh, that MoMA took to heart, what is the origin of modern art? Cezanne, Seurat, Gauguin, Van Gogh, very literally, these roots, which then go through modernism in Europe and then spread into this tree some of which is weighed down by tradition, uh, like illustration, still lifes, these kinds of things, but this yeah. sort of uh, fantastic designs that he did, these cartoons that he did, um, Reinhardt earlier in his career. And it, it feels like the, you know, that idea of finding your roots in the soil um, comes out so well in your pictures. And uh, just a, a, a triptych here, it's not actually a triptych, but three more of these images just to show people the breadth of uh, design that's going on um, in these in these paintings, and obviously you can see all of these in the galleries. And again, these interactions between the sexes um, in these uh, male female at least uh, interactions here, and the tree as a you know more and more uh, comment of a commentator in a way. The tree acts like a kind of chorus in a sense, I think, in some of these pictures in separating these two and reacting to what is going on sort of behind it. And then of course you have the Perdellas, which are um, you know, curiouser and curiouser. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, there, I mean, in any narrative painting, there's the, the question from, or from literature, which is on whose authority is this story being told? And, and, and you're right, I think it's a good observation, Jason, Jason that the, at a certain point, it's the tree in a way, the, that is the narrator, the tree. It's, it's the tree's yeah. version of the story that, was, that we're seeing. Yeah, it has that function. I see that more and more as I look at them more and more closely. And you know, the colors are really wonderful. So I'm sorry my slides don't do them justice, but um, hopefully people can get there to see them. Uh, just to go back a little bit, because it would be pointless to go through your career because a, a lot of people know it, and also it's so full and you've been painting uh, so interestingly for so long. I mean, the first time I came across your work was at Duke University in a class with Claude Chernusky on contemporary art, and he showed Tennyson. That was in 1984, uh -huh. Tennyson. Um, and it blew my mind as a Anglophile who was about to work on Victorian art, that someone in New York would be painting things that had some kind of, even if very conceptual relation to Tennyson. But I was looking back through uh, the works that, which everyone can find on your website. And these pictures seem to be somewhat signaling what you're now doing now, what you're now doing. Um, this kind of interaction between uh, some kind of figurative um, drawn cartoon figure and then abstraction in this case above. So it yeah. looks like it's coming from her brain. 
And then here on the right, uh, while I'm gone from 2016, which has a kind of vegetative form uh, coming into this crush of all different images in right. the center. Uh, good homework. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's what we do. Art historians, like Matt Vey Levenstein calls me a digger. That's what I do, dig and find these kinds of things. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's nice to look back and see these kinds of elements gestating, but then to see them come to fruition in a very uh, controlled series, I would say, yeah. um, is impressive. And of course, you're still working on it, as you can see in the view of the studio behind. But let me just end with a couple of works which go in a very different vein and don't have the tree and don't have the predella, and they act in a kind of metaphysical sense. But in a way, it feels like Peter Arno's figures have now entered your sort of pantheon of imagery, and they are now uh, productively or, or, or assaultively becoming part of your, um, uh, your mindset, at least, or your, your uh, characters that swing through your painting. So this one, Tree of Way 18, uh, with this guy who's staring at, I don't know what it is, we said maybe a rock, a potato, a sponge, who knows? Um, with a kind of uh, floating clock and these other elements and this sort of metaphysical representation. It reminds me of De Chirico and, mm -hmm. and other artists, but are these some of the later ones that you've done? Yeah, th this one, and there's, a, there's a, one with a pink ground, one with a blue ground. Those are the last three paintings to be finished. And, and everything you said is true. It's a very good observation. Thank you for your acuity as usual. The tree is sort of moving out of the picture. Arno is mm. kind of a, kind of subsumed into the into the, the more general stew. It's kind of been boiled down and now being kind of regurgitated yeah. in some other form. I mean, it's still the Arno character, but he's painted very differently. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say about it, except that I mean, the series had been going on now for over for two years. Yeah, it, I mean, there, there was a moment in the middle of the locked pandemic lockdown in which I thought. Oh, this is really the, I mean, I don't mean it in this flattering way. I just mean it in a kind of descriptive way. This is really the, the perfect pandemic series. It's the, you know, the toxic earth and the, you know, the kind of, you know, toxic nature. I don't, I mean, I think it's true. It's fine. I'm happy about it. But one keeps going and one keeps working. It's not just, I mean, I'm not a topical painter. So the, work will always, at least in my case, will always sort of evolve into something else and start to morph and other mm -hmm. things become more important. Obviously the clock is a, is a, is a, a an homage to Philip Guston, whose work has always been enormously important to me, but I, I think like a lot of other people, it has yeah, become increasingly so with the more, is, yeah. the more, the more we see it. Um, and that and that show, my gosh, that show at Hauser and Worth is just yeah, I mean, he's just he's just uh, you know he's that's that's art for the ages. I mean, it's with interest. Yeah. This is a whole other conversation as to how the reputations, which have really nothing to do with art anyway, that that's to do with fashion. But yeah, um, then no, there's a very very interesting point about Gustin on the level of abstraction turning into imagery and vice versa that mm. there are few more perfect examples of it so i i'm happy to use it as yet another compass point or mm. so yeah this the paints are getting looser and more mm. weirder shit is happening and you know we don't quite know yeah, what. yeah they feel they feel very um i don't know confident but how silly to say that but they it feels like the they, here you're you're employing the imagery in uh, more and more interesting ways um here is the same character what is he staring at Could, are you well, he's, actually, he, he's actually holding i mean the the, the pino arno bag is yeah this is a this is a dweeb at the beach who's right he's burying a woman in the sand and the, uh, okay the peter arno joke because the jokes are almost always sexist and some way yeah. not sexist really, but they're always dopey in that kind of you know male yeah. way. that he's burying her in the sand and he's putting a lot of sand on her breasts and the, in the uh, Arno cartoon that that's not the face in our cartoon the Arno cartoon it's this lady with a hat and she's saying that's enough sand Mr. McGillicuddy whatever his name is it's not <laughs> it's not very funny but it's kind of funny so he's 
But what's funny about him to me is just this cluelessness of his look and the dweebiness yeah. of the hat and whatnot. So yeah, he could, other people thought it was a big potato. It's fine. I don't really care what he's holding. It's not <laughs> in his hands. I painted him in another painting where there's nothing in his hands. It's just the gesture. Right. It's kind of funnier because then you don't. Yeah, there, there he is. is. You say he now he's looking yeah. at what's missing. That, like there used to be something in there, but I don't know what it is now. Yeah. So yeah, these are the same cast of characters. There is. I mean, we haven't even talked about the kind of cinematic mm. sensibility. I think these these are the world of this is the world of screwball comedy, which is which is the same yeah. period as Arno, say nineteen thirties. Preston Sturges, he's my favorite. Well, Someone he, mentioned him in the chat. Preston Sturges is probably the single greatest screenwriter ever to come out of Hollywood. So uh, funny, yeah. who's, who's you know timeless. The the sophistication of that dialogue is, is completely unequaled. Most of the Coen Brothers movies. As, a, as an aside, yeah. are one way or another a, re, a restaging of Preston Sturges as they would have yeah. to do. But anyway, that aside, um, the, well, anyway, if you think they, there's, they speak a kind of confidence, I'm happy to hear it because I'm wading into the water of leaving the structure, not, we're not leaving it behind, but mm. very much de emphasized. I'm putting these characters yeah. on stage and seeing how they interact. I do think of myself, I mean, I think of all different kinds of metaphors for painting, conductor, or stage mm -hmm. manager. But I think, of, I mean, if I had to say, you know, about myself, do I see myself as an actor or as a director? But I mean, clearly I'm a director, or maybe not even director, maybe just a stage manager. I mean, I'm basically choreographer or something. I'm, I'm yeah. giving these characters their cue, like, okay, you're on. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> Let just, him go. I'm just the guy who raises the curtain and then I give them their cue and then, you know, then they have to go on. So I'm, you know, I've, I'm, I've always been attracted to and have tried to incorporate into my work some sense of not just the theatrical, but actually the theater as a as a living, breathing place and a metaphor for action. I mean, people used to talk about painting in the fifties as a, as a kind of arena for action. I, I think of it as an arena for theater right? because theater is yeah. that place. Well, I mean, now that the figuration that you've been working with since the beginning is now you know back in a sense i mean it's always the art that i've been interested in as as a, as a art historian and a critic um and i know you know as part of the reason why there was resistance to probably your work in your early career was because of its figurative quality its illusion its emotionality its surrealist qualities you know the kinds of things that now that's what artists are doing and, and disconnect you know at the same time it was all there in the beginning so maybe the the Older critics, it's caught up. They've caught up to you in a sense, <laughs> in a way, or the, or the world around you has caught up to you. But, but I, I think that that cinematic element is is really critical in so many uh, young artists today, figurative artists who are working in that way, but also with narratival disconnect and sort of problem pictures um, where you have to, you know, there's no actual solution, but there are many different streams that you can take. Uh, with it, and then using these characters in repertory, in a sense, yeah. has be, has been very productive. Yeah, I mean, and then these floating elements, floating elements like Duchamp, and also like the dream sequence of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, with all the stuff flying by the house, and so many things coming together here. Yeah, I mean, there are many, obviously, many many theater painters working today, and some are excellent, and some have incredible mm -hmm. skill, incredible. Uh, chops as a, 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 in their you know, figurative painting, but everyone's work is different. Um, I think what's interesting is, is to try to distinguish things in terms of tonality and mm. uh, set the sensibility of figurative painting and some what what is the like the emotional temperature. Uh, I think yeah. the I'm repeating myself. But I think the the world of screwball comedy, it's not that I'm trying to make screwball comedies per se, but the world of that is um, 
it's like it's like turning up the volume although it's not we're not talking about sound we're talking about something mm -hmm. else is a almost kind of franticness or an anticness more than frantic yeah that is it's just always been there in the work i can't explain exactly why or i can't even defend it i'm not even sure i like it but it's just there mm -hmm. yeah people have always asked me how come you paint this how come you paint that I, it it's a it's essentially a misconception at least for me in my in my mm -hmm. view that I'm not so sure I mean, what the question implies is that art's like a menu in a restaurant and, you, and the artist picks one, I have one of those, I'll have one of those, one of those. It's not my experience. My experience has been, it, it kind of picks me and I feel fortunate if something picks me. I mean, let's say if something holds my attention for more than a minute, I, and I'm very grateful, but I don't, necessarily question it but i it's it's i always feel that question of well, why did you paint that it's almost putting the question backwards it's more like you paint it and then maybe you figure out what it means rather than the other way around if that makes any sense yeah yeah i, I think it does i mean you, you just you you have the compulsion you must do it you know and and, and then you kind of figure it out as you go. I mean, that makes total sense. That's how we, in a way, how, how I write, you know, in a way you have the compulsion to do it, Yeah. to do it. Let's just note one thing before we turn over to questions is that I was at, uh, at the, the other hat that David wears. I was at the Liechtenstein show at the Parish Art Museum last weekend. And I was delighted to see that one of the, uh, one of the wall labels for one of the pictures quoted you mm. um, on Liechtenstein. Um, so that idea that, you know, you're operating in many different realms now and, uh, and in a kind of parallel way as a art critic, um, just published a volume of your writings. Um, I was really struck by this terrific review of the Donald Judge show, which was in the New York Review of Books in December, 2020. People should look up David's writings. Um, they're, they're terrific. And many artists that I talk to have been, you know, really complimentary of the things that you've been doing and they wish they could write like you. And also with, you know, the, the, the attitude which you have to have as a serious critic, everyone should read this extraordinary sort of, um, uh, discussion, takedown, whatever you want to call it, minimalism, um, you know, the wonderful judge show, but seeing it from a different angle, uh, people should have a look anyway. So kudos to you. Uh, for that. That's a discussion for another time, I think. Uh, Thank in the you, meantime, man. people should go and, and enjoy the exhibition while you can through Saturday. I encourage you to get there to Scarstead. And thank you so much for giving your time and uh, doing it this evening, David, um, and uh, deep appreciation. And I uh, turn it over to Nick for a question. Thanks very much, Jason. It was a pleasure. Thanks, thanks for everybody who tuned in. I also add in thank you so much, David, and thank you, Jason, for this wonderful conversation. Uh, we just posted in the chat the link to the exhibition. I do encourage everyone that is able to to go and see the show. It's on view until this Saturday the 30th. Uh, but yeah, we're going to get right into our Q&A. So first, I'm going to pass the mic over to our friend, Andrew Rulbright. Andrew, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Hopefully. Just a moment. Andrew, can you, do you see the prompt on your screen? Yeah. There you are. Hi. Take it away. It's not working. Andrew, it's not oh, working. Andrew, sorry, we're playing the, the Zoom game. Now? There you so are. Perfect. Uh, yeah, we're back and forth. Uh, sorry, David and Jason, thank you both so much. This is a perfect way to spend an evening and it's great to hear about the work more in depth. I wrote a question, so I get right. It's a little bit of a longer question. It's a two-parter, so I'll put it in the chat too. But David, I'm sorry if I'm mischaracterizing, but it seems like detachment plays an important role in your work. And this body of work is utilizing pastiche as a strategy to question who in culture gets to form style and how style relates to desire. If that's a fair interpretation, this body of work operates as a strategic project of who is ultimately deciding style and its role. 
or as you said, on whose authority is this story being told, do you feel obligated to make this work? Uh, is this the work you would want to make if there weren't any stakes or consequences to painting? And if not, is there a painter you'd want to make work like if you didn't feel obligated to use painting as a challenge to what style is? Wow, that's an incredibly interesting question. Thanks for the question. I hope I understand it. Um, Dolly, could you could you ask it again, like in one sentence? What what's the? I'm sorry. What what is the obliga obligation that I'm? Well, uh, you're a wonderful critic and a great writer, and I feel like this is in so many ways a strategic and conceptual practice. Um, and I guess I'm asking is, where is your desire within the practice? Because it is critical of so many important things. Mm -hmm. If there were no stakes to your painting, is this the type of painting you would choose to make in any circumstances? Mm -hmm. Like, do you enjoy making it? Or is it like a critical project? No, I, I think that I am in, in my painting, while I'm painting, I'm much less critical than it might appear otherwise and that other people might feel. I, I, I believe that, I also feel it's about writing, for example, for, but in the same way, but let's set that aside. I think painting is a priori an act of empathy and it's an act of empathic identification. And it's almost impossible for me anyway, other people could have a very different idea about it. For me, it's very difficult to paint something without having that uh, empathic identification. It's so I'm not, you can deconstruct something and love it at the same time. You, you don't bother to deconstruct things you don't love. You, you, only, you only hurt the ones you love, you know, that's just the way life is. So, I don't feel like I have to, you know, justify these people and their sexist attitudes and whatnot. They're from another time. They're from another place. They're useful to me today if I can breathe life into them or let them breathe life into me. I'm, I'm a willing participant, and I, and I think that, you know, approaching painting with an open heart. Is, is at least as important as, a, as having a, the critical mind. Because I, I think it's, you know, we want to be firing on all cylinders and like that critical um, idea of, the whole idea of criticality, I think is, I mean, this is just my personal experience. It, it, it's, it, it got overplayed for all kinds of reasons we could go into another time and particularly want to go into it. That there's, I mean, I've written about it many times and I've alluded to it in you know, numerous essays. That the whole intentionality idea both, both is and is not actually true. I mean, it, it's true, but it's, if that's all that's true, it's probably not very interesting. This has to be so many other things operating on a true level, you know? So, but, but I mean, your question's fascinating and I, yeah, of course we're always deconstructing things as we, as we use them. I mean, it's funny that just then you showed the, the one slide of Roy's very early work. That is a fantastic show. Unfortunately, I think it's just about to close if anyone could see it, that Roy's pre-pop work is, Kind of scabrous deconstruction of American mythology. And yet it's only possible because Roy loves it so deeply. And he, he it's, I mean, Roy, who I knew fairly well, made officially made two or three paintings that he called self portrait, self portrait with mirror, self portrait with cheese, maybe the two or three others. But it was a joke because the, 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 you know, the idea about his work is he was never to be seen in his work. You'd never find him in his work. It was way too objective. It was way too detached. It was way too pop. But the pre-pop work is full of self-portraits. It's one big self-portrait. Every character in the painting is Roy in a funny way. So what does that prove? I don't know, nothing. It's just that the, you know, all these things coexist simultaneously. Thanks for the question. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, Andrew and David for that answer. Um, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to my colleague, Malvika Jolly, to read a question on behalf of an audience member. Over to you, Malvika. Thank you, Nick. Um, thank you, David, and thank you, Jason. I've really enjoyed this conversation a lot. Um, and as you've been speaking, I've been thinking like, really, you should have a podcast together because it's such good, um, it's, it's just really fantastic. Uh, the question I'm going to ask comes from Judy. Put Ayo. that together, Malvika. Put hey, that hey. together. Let's see what happens. I'll, I'll take right. <laughs> the question I have um, comes from Judy Aiello in the chat. Uh, it's, a, it's the gender question. Hmm. And I'll read it as is. She asks, uh, as a male image maker of male dominance, how do you see the women's progressive impact on change? Does any of uh, you know these discussions of sexism change in your work? Um, and you know, I, I also want to bring up. We were thinking about how to how to edit this question to potentially make it kinder or softer or et cetera. And then we chose not to. Um, hmm. So you know, that's also something I wanted to serve up. Ask it again. Read it again, please. As an image maker of male dominance, hmm. which perhaps you could also read as an as a male image maker. Okay. How do you see the women's progressive impact on change? Uh, you know, does any of this conversation on sexism change in your work, perhaps mm. change your work, apply to your work? Uh, well, the short answer is yes, of course. I mean, we're all living in the world. Uh, so, you know, our, my antenna are attuned to change, I, hopefully the way, you know, the way everyone's are. Um, I, I don't know where to go with the question exactly. I wish that if it, it, is the questioner on on the on Zoom. Can can we get some more elaboration? I mean, I, I kind of feel like I'm on the verge of understanding where the question really means, but I'm not quite sure I really do. Um, I will say just uh, can you can you can you try to elucidate and try to kind of flush it out. I think I sorry I don't I don't mean to speak for you Malvika but I, I just want to mention David that the asker um, had to leave which is why we're oh, asking on okay, her behalf. Okay. So I can't I don't want to speak for her I'm not sure if uh, we could elucidate any better on it but. Well Malvika can you can you can you put it in a different you know restate it a different way. What, what do you think? I mean, I do think there is kind of a universal question here about kind of gender and representation. Hmm. Um, and, you know, you, you clearly depict um, gendered subjects. Hmm. I think, you know, you've also had like a long and storied career. And I wonder if the way you think about those depictions, um, if you've, you know, observed it changing, uh, do you have reflections on kind of uh, gendered representations? Um, or do you? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Question? yeah. Yeah. No, the, I mean, it's true that the the gender ishness, the genderedness of the images is rather in these these pictures is rather brutal. It's very, I mean, no kind of sin. It's very black and white. The you know, men are men, women are women, and they don't understand each other. That's the the kind of starting point. That's the fundamental premise. Um, you know, when Eva finds that painful, funny, or just painful, painful, one or the other, or, or painful, irrelevant, you know, those are probably the three options. I, I'm not sure, um, I, I mean, here's what I think, my ambivalence or um, in, entering into the kind of fraught negotiated space is I feel like that's in the work, although perhaps more encoded or more obscure, it's not necessarily on the surface. The one of the last paintings that Jason that we showed the, the pink one with the pink ground, the central character, instead of instead of the painting being bisected by a tree, the painting is bisected by this figure. And the figure has a very indeterminate gender. It's, I mean, not that I necessarily intended that way, but people have variously said to me, what's that guy doing there? And they've said to me, what's that girl doing there? What's that woman doing there? 
So it's the person's in a bathrobe holding a toothbrush. Right, right. So it's it's either you know it it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be identified, but the um, but the slipperiness of that identity and the you know the contemporary where the fluidity of it is is clearly in the painting. I think the the shrillness of the masculinity in the paintings is clearly, I mean, it's clearly there with an attitude. It's not there, you know, in a neutral way. It's part of the, it's part of the energy of the paintings that this is, this is, a, you know, a misdirected kind of, you know, kind of consciousness. That hopefully is yeah. assumed into something. You know, it's either it's either created this you know toxic environment, or and or it's going or it's going away, or it's you know we're being you know some other growth is taking its place. It's very. I think also. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I was going to say it's it's I... a challenging and very very interesting uh, proposition to represent gender as a gendered person in painting. It's something I've been thinking about for a very long time. I don't know if I, maybe I'm only just at the very beginning of being, uh, figuring how to do it. And I, I, uh, I mean, there's the obvious ways to do it, but that's not the kind of thing I would be interested in doing. So, I mean, I think it's, um, it's uh, you, again, you have to be able to identify with something to critique it or, and, it's not, I'm certainly not trying to portray the, um, you know, one side or another side. I'm trying to portray what it feels like to be in a situation. And the situation is sometimes fraught and sometimes funny and sometimes, um, you know, familiar and sometimes feels very, far away from us, uh, there's, you know, sometimes I, oops, my phone is, um, <laughs> sorry, the, uh, sorry to turn it off. The, um, you know, the world of the paintings is, is both, as I said, I think very, at the very beginning of the show, is, is both us and not us, it's both close to us and far from us. So I, 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 and I think that's for me a point of interest. Also, also would like to just point out, that, you know, when you're talking about screwball comedies, mm -hmm. um, that the female characters are often, you know, the voice of reason and the most powerful character. If you think of Rosalind Russell in His Girl Friday or Veronica Lake in Sullivan's Travels or Catherine Hepburn and everything, right? Um, you know, there's well, something just, to, yeah. to consider in these kind of yeah. dynamics. I mean, this, this, and it comes out in these paintings. Also. I think, I think I also said, you know, at the very top of the show, it, this is, goes back to Shakespeare, that the, even though you could say, well, it's always a masculine world, there's always, you know, the king is the king. Mm -hmm. The, the interesting voices are almost always the women's the female characters that, as you, as you say, Jason, they're not, not just the voice of reason, the voice of, well, they are the voice of reason, the voice of, uh, I mean, but this goes back to the Greeks. I mean, we, the the female characters in Euripides are are the ones we go to for understanding how what life is really like, and that is, you know, something I'm you know very grateful for. And also, I think it's quite different when you have the man and the woman in the image as opposed to just the body of the woman, right? So that's that's something that makes it more complex and, um, you know, it, it does seem to be a kind of reflection of, of our, you know, evolution as people and a society. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, if there was a more question, I have to think more about it to really develop, you know, a fleshed out answer, but, but it's, yeah, that, that's the right direction, I think. Well, I want to say thank you. Thank you both for, for working through that answer. And I really, really, really like what you said that it's sort of a misdirected consciousness is an attitude. It's like an atmosphere in the painting. And, and, and I, I really like, I feel like that's a piece of an answer perhaps, um, but thank you. 
Thank, thank you all. Um, Any other questions? I, I think in the interest of time, we'll take one more question. Um, I am going to pass the mic over to dear friend of the rail, GE Schwartz. GE, you can turn on your mic now. Thank you so much to the rail, to Jason and to David, of course. I first got hooked on your work because uh, I saw uh, Dean Martin in some come running about 93. Mm. And, 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 and I, I really more, in, I, I'm as much of in, into to writing as I am into to taking in physical art. And immediately I flashed on John Ashbury and David Markson. Just the way it was put together and the way I felt. And, and, and because it, it seemed to sort of follow kind of a, a Hibbian theory thing of the way things are fired together and come together and cross associations and all that kind of thing. And, and, and the way you as an artist make the connections with the images and the way we see them. Is there any connection with that all? Is there anything to this? I'm sorry, connection between, between what and what? Well, no, the, the basic idea of, um, of coming across and, and, and putting images together from disparate places and all this kind of thing, and, 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 and also is sort of the Hibbian theory thing of the way things are fired and right. they sort of come together paired and cross paired, right. even though they're very disparate. Right. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm not a theoretical person. I'm a kind of an instinctual person. It took me a long time, or actually a long time. It took me more than 10 minutes. It took me a while to appreciate John Ashbury's poetry. And once I did, I loved it. And I, and I think the reason it took me, I don't think I resisted it, but anyway, I had to look at it for a while. And then, I mean, John and I later became quick, very good friends. But, uh, because he was doing something that I was trying to do, and he was doing it you know, brilliantly. Uh, making it seem as though it was just stuff rattling around his head, but of course, on the page it was absolutely perfect. It couldn't change one, you know, stress would ruin the poem. It was so that feeling of tapping directly into the unconscious was so palpable, and that he could sustain it for so long. Anyway. My, one of the, my great regrets is that I didn't get to make an illustrated book with John. We talked about it for 25 years and somehow I just never got around to it and then it was too late, the way it always is. But I think that that particular painting you mentioned, Dean Martin's Something Running, uh, it, for me, exemplifies what I was trying to describe earlier, that it's a painting made out of images, but it's, it's the look and feel and painterly attack of the painting is much closer to an all over abstraction. I mean, it, I mean, I'm not trying to flatter myself by the comparison, but it's, it's really like a, like a Pollock. It's just, if you just look at it, turn it upside down, it, it, it has the interwoven lyrical skeins of paint, like, a, like, a, like an abstract painting, but it's all made from images. It's like, it's like I don't know, is there something really ridiculous about it in a way? It's like people who make, something to resemble something else. And you're like, why, why don't you do it? But anyway, um, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not, I don't have any theory about the removal of hierarchy or proximity. It's, it's all done instinctively. I don't know why, it just, it just, it's how I see things. I've always seen no, I could never really focus on one. I was that really not a good painter in art school because I could I couldn't focus on the painting. I kept seeing the painting and then what was behind the painting, and I kept trying to incorporate what was behind the painting and the painting. I mean, that just being a mess. So the, I don't know where it comes from, but that's just the way I'm made. So does that answer? Is that what you were asking? Yeah, very appreciative. I I just like I love that 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 cross associational thing that you're doing even with this work now. And, and also, with particularly in Sun Came Running, it almost reminds me of that fantastic Oracle car carnival scene at the end of the film, so. Yeah, yeah, well, anyway, that, I mean, the, the, the film is, uh, is a touchstone and, uh, you know, the, the line, of course, comes from the Godard film Contempt, where there's there, that, the, the whole idea of 
of the of the conceit of the of the line is the reference to the film. It's a painting is deeply referential in that way, but it is the counterpuntal nature, not just of line shape, color, texture, or not you know sound, but actually of image, reference, touch, position, emphasis. I mean, all of those things are orchestrated. All of those things are counterpuntal. And for me, that's the fun part. Yeah. So happy for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. And, and also, if you haven't seen it yet or looked at, look at uh, Ashbury's um, um, final book. If you, oh, wow. Yeah. I haven't parallel, seen parallel lives, because there's, he references a lot of the screwball comedy stuff. Yeah. And um and and further back even to uh, a lot of other things and um, and cartoons from the New Yorker and all that stuff. So yeah. oh, you're no. you're in sync you're in sync with him even if he's you know somewhere else. <laughs> even beyond. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that, G. Thank you. Thank you, GE, and thank you, David, for that answer. Um, Usually we hand the mic over to the rail zone Fong H. Bowie to ask the final question of the evening. I am here to let you know, unfortunately he had to be at another appointment this evening. So he sends his love and his gratitude to you, David, for joining us. Um, but I lied to you all. I think we can take one more question. Uh, Chris, no pressure, you're last, but I'm gonna give you the mic to ask the final question of our Q and A. Um, I'm gonna make sure, there you are. Thanks. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, Perfect. David and Jason. Um, David, I was looking through um, your earlier work as you were lecturing about this body of work, which I did see in person. Um, so obviously, most of the cartoons in the paintings are black and white, and that, that was how they were originally drawn and presented. I noticed that at least one of them was you painted in color. Um, but I was just wondering, in your work in general, um, I noticed a lot of usage of monochrome hues or black and white representations. Um, is that mostly a formal device or do you think of conceptual concerns as well? Good question. I, not, I'm not sure I've ever really been able to distinguish the two. I think a lot of decisions that are made in painting, at least as far as, as I can tell, and certainly as far as my own experience goes, I think are made out of expedience. Uh, I remember reading somewhere about Frank Stella's decision to make the stretcher bars deeper rather than flat, uh, which ushered in a, in a whole era of criticism having to do with objecthood or whatnot, that where Frank said it was actually, it was just an expediency. I was just trying to make a cheap stretcher that didn't bow and it, I just, it seemed easier to turn the wood the other direction is that then these things came off of the wall. And it ended up suiting his purpose. But when I first started painting figuratively, I was so rusty, having spent with all those years at Calis when I should have been developing my painting technique, all I was doing was screwing around with conceptual art and stuff. And it was like five wasted years. So then I, then I came to New York and I didn't have a studio. And I, I mean, years went by, I didn't pick up a brush. So when I started painting again, I was really a primitive. I was making such primitive work because it's really all I could do. And I was trying to find a way to make a figure to paint that made sense that, well, I wasn't a realist in the sense that I was going to describe the reality in front of me. So that wasn't going to happen. But I wasn't really an abstract painter. I didn't have the conviction for that. So I gradually evolved into painting pictures of photographs, which, I mean, I didn't really know it was in the air or was going to be in the air for the next 30 years. Uh, it's, it was simply a way that the, the photograph already broke, already broke the world down into darks and lights, a pattern of, of, of lights and darks, which is the foundation of, of any realist painting, at least as I understand it. Then, the painting simply started out as drawing, trying to figure out, okay, I'm gonna, I can make, I can draw that thing, I can make that thing coexist with that thing. And when I started painting them, the idea of local color was just over my head. I just simply wasn't up to it. 
my concerns were so much more basic. It really was the punk rock of painting. I mean, I had, I had at my at most, I had at my disposal three chords and, 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 and no tech, no fingering technique. I just had three chords. So that meant black. I had a lot of black paint and the paintings ended up being mostly black and white because it was what I could handle. And after, and then it became kind of a style and it started to have a, take on a meaning and to take on a identity. Things had a very strong identity, which I liked, but I always felt for years that I didn't, I wasn't showing any, what I knew about color until a certain point, um, so I'll change it change many, many times, change it dramatically. But in these paintings, I've in a way returned to the world of black and white. The, as I think I said at the top of the show, the paintability of the Arno figures is precisely because they're conceived in terms of areas of, of light and dark. The contrast of light and dark is what creates the sense of volume and for, for instance, of form, excuse me. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the grayscale is a fantastic backdrop for color. And I think you know, if, if you saw them in, in person, you could see how the, the color functions in a way which is very vibrant, and very uh, almost ebullient. And part of the reason for that is because it's set against this backdrop of silvery grays. Wait, but that, was that your question? I'm sorry, maybe I feel like I've digressed, Chris, from what the question was. There's something about black. Yeah, I think I use a lot of black out of primitivism, expediency, and then starting to like it, and then feeling, and then feeling kind of um, hemmed in by it. And then it was, you know, like, but it took years to find some other alternative. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chris, and um, thank you so much, David, uh, for your generosity this evening, and, and to you, Jason, for your also your generosity, and um, thank you to everyone for asking a question. Um, here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading, so I am thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the evening, Carlos Saganya. Uh, just a very brief introduction before I pass the mic over. Um, poet, writer, and translator Carlos Agaña is an MFA candidate in creative writing in Spanish at New York University. He has written three poetry books and also writes about art, politics, and pop culture for various Venezuelan publications. In his last year of college, he was one of the faces of the student movements amidst the Venezuelan presidential crisis. Without further ado, uh, Carlos, over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick, uh, for introducing me. Um, well, screens tend to isolate us and turn our reflections into our soul companions. So it's nice to see that today screens are bridges between many. I'll read uh, three poems from my second book, A Cerdaño, first in Spanish and then in English, as translated by Rachel Whalen, a person whose existence I'm very thankful for. I hope they're having the time of their life in Mexico where they now live. So I hope this is as interesting as I think it will be. <laughs> Cuando la vida te suelta una bofetada, te suelta tú recto a un laberinto, te sacude hasta perder la consistencia, te escupe en la cara como si la hubieras traicionado, te lanza al coliseo en contra de toda voluntad, aprendes que hay pesos como el de la luna menguante que sacan hernias delicadas. When life slaps you, lets loose on you, when it drops you straight into a maze, when it shakes you senseless, when it spits in your face as if you were a traitor, when it throws you into the Colosseum against all of your will, you learn that there are stones like the waning moon that remove 
frail hernias. This second poem of mine uh, is one of the few poems I have titled. It's called Mandato, and it is very much inspired by Ezra Pound's writing. He volado más allá de otras distancias. He entendido que no hay nada que hacer. He vibrado junto a mis terremotos. He sabido que hay desgracia en tus músculos. He filtrado todas mis desdichas. He sentido que camino solo hay uno repleto de espinas y miradas. He destruido mis tímpanos, mis ojos, mis dientes. He rascado la costra más oculta. He ocultado las costas más hermosas. He mentido con inmensas sonrisas. He viajado a corazones indeseados. He querido llorar pensando en ti. He situado y sitiado mis hábitos más destructivos y luego los he usado como definición. He dormido sin un vicio a mi lado desde cuando. He despertado con rabia y con ganas de morir. He soñado los encuentros más ilusos y luego los he vivido y tras ellos mis ánimos de vida. He escrito como un degenerado páginas y páginas que se confunden con servilletas. He insultado a quienes alguna vez admiré. He entrenado mi afán de detestar hasta el punto en que lo amable se ha vuelto escaso. He publicado palabras que me apelan. He chillado con noticias sin futuro. He comido los frutos del privilegio. He rimado bajo miradas acuciosas. He reído como un dios irresponsable. He cruzado los puentes entre los dos y los bombardeé. Y ahora el frío. I have flown beyond other expanses. I have understood that there is nothing to be done. I have trembled along my fault lines. I have known that your muscles carry misfortune. I have purified all of my failures. I have sensed that there is only one road full of thorns and unwanted eyes. I have destroyed my eardrums, my eyes, my teeth. I have scratched the most hidden scab. I have hidden the most beautiful coasts. I have lied through immense miles. I have traveled to unwanted hearts. I have wanted to cry thinking of you. I have situated and surrounded my most destructive habits and then I have worn them as they were meant to be worn. I have slept without a vice by my side since when I have woken enraged and looked forward to death. I have dreamt up the most indescribable encounters, and then I have left them, and after them, my spirits lived. I have written as a degenerate pages and pages that you could mistake for napkins. I have insulted those whom I once admired. I have taught myself how to hate until that which is lovable has become scarce. I have published words that I am ashamed of. I have bawled at the news of no future. I have eaten the fruits of privilege. I have rhymed beneath an urgent gaze. I have laughed like an irresponsible God. I have crossed the bridges between us two and I bumped them and now the cold. And uh, this last poem, uh, I'd like to dedicate to Ana Luisa. I hope we get to meet to meet each other again uh, sooner than later, I'd say. Si yo fuera un disco rayado, quisiera que cada pausa, cada repetición tuviese tus uñas como causa. Cuánto adoraría que me cogieses con rabia sin jabón en tus manos y ensuciarás mi faz más brillante. Si yo fuera disco rayado, si yo fuera una de las rayas, un solo así, yo te veré repetido hasta la insignificancia. Si yo fuera una voz tornada en ruido, 
Si yo fuera magia, vuelta, compresión, distorsión, atención a la radio, quita esa vaina, si yo fuera y por ello no quisieras escucharme, me deslizaría hasta el suelo más transitado de tu casa para volverme huella y rompecabezas y no ser gozado por más nadie. If I were a broken record, I would want every pause, every repetition to be caused by your nails. How much I would adore it if you seized me with rage without soap on your hands and tarnished my most brilliant face. If I were a broken record, if I were one of the scratches, and a través de mi persiana americana, repeated to the point of insignificance. If I were a voice turned to pure noise, if I were magic turned into compression, distortion, attention to the radio, make it stop. If I were, and because of it, you didn't want to listen to me, I would slip towards the most worn down floor of your house to become footprint and riddle and to be enjoyed by no one else. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Carlos. Um, thank you for joining us this evening and for concluding that our event so, so beautifully. Um, I once more want to thank you, David, and thank you, Jason. Um, I will post in the chat again uh, a link to David's show at Scarstead. It is open until October 30th, and I encourage everyone that is able to make it to go, uh, go and see the show. So uh, we are here every single day at 1 p.m. Uh, join us tomorrow for our 57th Radical Poetry Reading, curated by Hua Nguyen and featuring Vic Nao, Diana Koi Nguyen, Dao Strom, and Suvankam Tamamongsa. Apologies for mispronouncing most of those names. Mm. Uh, you can now, everyone, turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye and wish everyone a happy Tuesday evening. So thank you once again, David. And thank you all. It was, really, it was a real pleasure. Thank you for organizing. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you very much to everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Thank, thank you for attending. Great panel. Wonderful. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, Carlos. Yeah. Thank you, David, for hanging out with us for thank so you, much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. We deeply appreciate thank it. You, thank you. Thank you. See you guys soon. Mary. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye, Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have thank a good you, Chris, evening, everyone. Thanks for that question. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, GE. Oh. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Night swim. See you later. Night swim. <laughs> and we will see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye, everyone.